Find me sadistic. Hey there, folks. I'm Mike for CMCC Builds, and finally, the gauntlet is back. Today's video is the first in the level 10 series created by Ludic Savant, who you may remember as the pilot of the monk build that traversed the original level 14 gauntlet. Having DM'd and played in that level 14 gauntlet, Ludic decided to create another gauntlet at this new level and put a unique Ludic spin on the encounters. The first big change is that this gauntlet is designed not for a single PC with sidekicks, but three individual level 10 characters. In other words, as we'll see today, for this run, go ahead and bring your friends. Next, instead of a single plus one item, unique to your class, players choose from a magic item whitelist. This gives more flexibility and power to the players. This gauntlet run is designed more like a traditional dungeon crawl with a greater emphasis on sight, traps, and other aspects of the exploration pillar. This may feel more like a one-shot than the previous gauntlet. In fact, players can choose which direction to go in the dungeon. It's not a set flow from the first to last encounter, which helps to balance the adventure across multiple build types. A big criticism of the level 14 gauntlet was the difficulty of the first encounter in the flooded catacombs, especially for melee marshals. This gives the players a choice and potentially allows them to play to their strengths. So when players enter the dungeon, rather than rolling initiative, they can choose how to approach that first encounter and set the tone for the entire gauntlet run. And finally, the encounters themselves emphasize a small number of capable foes rather than masses of weak enemies as we've seen in the past gauntlets which makes editing these videos much easier. So thank you, Ludic. And on that note, a very big thank you to Ludic and Draco who helped edit this video, which means we can get the videos out faster to you. So like, subscribe, and spread the word. That way we know you appreciate what we do here at the channel. I'd be remiss if I didn't thank Chris from Treant Monk's Temple for taking the gauntlet plunge a second time. Some of you remember his original gauntlet run, which had a couple missteps in terms of rulings, with time between encounters and DM decisions, which some people, including Chris, felt leaned into adversarial DMing. Personally, having watched that run a half dozen times, I, I didn't see it. And Chris himself changed his mind after some reflection, which you can see in his comments on the video. And his appearance and reactions to this gauntlet run confirm that there is absolutely no reason why gauntlet runs should be adversarial in any way. That is why the essence of that intro quote from the veteran gauntlet DM John Sakari is so important. The mentality should be, and generally is, I hope you can make it through this thing, but for the integrity of the project and community, I'm going to be as tough yet fair as possible. The gauntlet is here to make everyone better. DMs, players, and optimizers. If you want to make a difference or think you can do it better, put some skin in the game. Join the gauntlet community, DM some runs, put a build through a gauntlet of your choice, or just chat with other people on Discord discussing rules, improvements, and occasionally the meaning of life. It's free, it's fun, and we welcome you. Thank you again, Chris, for your time. I hope you enjoyed the experience, and thank you to the friends you brought along, and to all those watching now, enjoy. Because it's time to set the stage. With precious little time to spare, a brave spy has risked his life to bring our heroes the following information. A deep dragon hoards knowledge in a cruel and dangerous underdark laboratory. There, it has made a discovery of terrible significance and plans to trade this secret to a drow matron intent on using it to make war on the surface. A war the surface will not win. The secret? A means to corrupt nature into horrific monsters powerful and numerous enough to lay waste to any realm their commanders please. The adventurers have just 3 hours and 20 minutes to destroy the three prototype monsters, ensuring their secret origins cannot be reverse engineered. Gather the keys from the Deep Dragon's four lieutenants to open the warded gate to the vault of the Deep Dragon Vermithraxes and vanquish that Deep Dragon before the Drow Matron and her elite entourage arrive to finalize the deal. Our heroes approach the dungeon on the way to the Deep Dragon's Underdark Laboratory. Tomcat Jones, a plasmoid level 10 creation bard piloted by Chris, with 83 hit points and a staggeringly low 13 armor class. Yes, you heard that correctly. 13. The D&D optimizer is jamming out with a 13. Tomcat is accompanied by Josie, a variant tiefling divine soul sorcerer 1, glamour bard 5, Peace Cleric 1. Oh yeah, the Triant Monk team is rocking a level 1 Peace Cleric dip. And a Dow Warlock 3. Josie is rolling with an 18 armor class and 71 hit points. And finally, the third member of the party, holding the band together, is Peacat 
for short because I don't want to spend the next six hours of my life beeping out an innocuous word because YouTube can't tell the difference between an informal word for a domesticated feline and a curse word. So, PCAT it is. A tabaxi, of course. Rune Knight 7, Soul Knife Rogue 3, with a very solid 20 armor class and 91 hit points. Both Math Guy Dave and Ramen Goblin have been featured on Triant Monk's Temple, so those names may sound familiar to you, in case you're wondering. Tomcat chose Mithril full plate armor, but has passed that off to Peacat. He also brings along a bullseye lantern, healing potions, and all these items packed away in one of four chests loaded onto a cart. The barding and exotic saddle are used on his Pegasus, summoned the day before with a Summon Greater Steed spell. Josie opted for the Sentinel Shield, healing potions, and these non-magical items. As part of her Pact Boon, Josie chose the Pact of the Talisman and has passed that off to Peacat. Peacat chose a Cloak of Protection and equipped Tom's Mithril Plate and Josie's Talisman, along with more healing potions and these items here. And now let's see how this band of adventurers does and how long I can keep these rock and roll metaphors going. If I run out of metaphor ammo, I may have to bring in the big puns for this one. Prepare yourselves. It might get ugly. As the team enters the Underdark, pulling a heavy cart with the large winged Celestial trudging through the tight turns and claustrophobic tunnels, Tomcat Jones, the amorphous plasmoid, can't help but laugh at his companion's struggles. It's so easy to squeeze through small crevices, and then I'll squeeze through a one-inch crevice just to make him feel bad. With no immediate danger in sight, Josie and the cats take in their surroundings. A hub, sparsely lighted by bioluminescent fungi, branches off into various sections. Ahead of them, a locked iron door with a symbol of an eye and an open book, the archives. To the east, they see a sign identifying the specimen labs. Off to the west, the crystal mines. Scattered around are other doors that the party can't quite see from their current perspective. Before exploring their options, Josie casts Gift of Alacrity twice for herself and Tomcat Jones, who in turn upcasts Longstrider on himself and Peacat. It's not unusual to be going through a dungeon. <laughs> Peacat then pulls a mysterious purple flower from his cape, flicks it in the air, it floats for a moment and dissolves, absorbed by his fellow bandmates. Some songs are best left unheard. The link from Psychic Whispers has been established for four hours, based on the d6 roll. They will have this for the duration of the adventure. The group heads west, with Tomcat seeping into one of the chests on the 10x10 cart. Before they reach the Crystal Mines, they see a door directly ahead with a passive perception of 17. They're able to hear a commotion inside as if something has been slammed against the ground or a wall. Uh, moshing without music is a real shame. In response, Josie uses Emboldening Bond with a verse from her new song. In a world of whiskers and furry delight, where moonlight shimmers on a cat-filled night, there's a rhythm stirring a purr in the air. Listen closely now, you'll hear it everywhere. And Tomcat inspires Peacat with a quick ditty. What's new, Pussycat? Whoa, 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 whoa. And Pussycat is inspired. A search for traps reveals nothing despite a roll of 27. Peacat sneaks through the door with a 24 stealth check. He silently pushes open and past the entrance into the main chamber. It appears to be a barracks of sorts, with a pair of cute and lovable flumps wrestling each other. Each flump claims the other is an imposter. And since neither has a goatee, the heroes are forced to nail an insight check, which they do, revealing a flump that's uncomfortable with its new form. But it is a fan of the adventuring party's renowned music. A clever trick of telepathy. Uh, Josie's just gonna, like, yell telepathically to Pussycat. Uh, kill the one on the right! And watch the flumps and see if they do anything. Confirms the suspected imposter flump. The fake flump gives a final word of warning before it perishes, disincorporating into a gooey mess of white animal and plant matter. Soon all of you will be me. All of you will be me. The plasmoid Tomcat Jones eyes the slimy pool of viscera a little too fondly. Wow, it's quite pretty in its native form. As thanks for killing the imposter, the flump offers a haven for the party to rest if they find themselves in need. The flumps have been feeding off the psychic emanations of the denizens of the dungeon and are acutely aware of the ensuing plot to destroy the surface world. As the band of adventurers pushes towards the crystal mines, the excited to be alive and even more excited to meet the pop culture sensation that is Josie and the Cats, shouts after them, the way you're headed, that there's the crystal mines, where they gather materials for their experiments. And if you want to gather your materials for gameplay, only Crits has you covered. 
Do you believe in the magic of a well-wrought tale and the thrill of a perfect roll? You're watching The Gauntlet, of course you do. Do you want some new dice to add to your collection? Who doesn't? Or if you're like my son, you're just getting your collection started. Only Crits is the best place to do it. The selection is fantastic and they have great prices including the Dragon Eye set with six, yes six, dice sets. I already got several sets myself, including this ancient copper dragon set for my six year old and I may or may not have told him it was forged with the scales of a mythical worm I befriended in my younger adventuring days when magic and wonder were still alive. I'm not sure if he bought it, but you sure can and use this link, onlycrits.com slash cmccbuilds and use the coupon code cmcc to get 12% off everything on the site. That is a fantastic deal, so please check it out. Use the link in the description below and explore the wonderful products. And if you like what you see, don't forget to use the code to get your discount. As they enter the narrow passage leading to the mines, the cart scrapes against the walls until it simply can go no further. It's stuck. Peacat, flexing his feline muscles, lifts the 5x5x5 crate off the cart and carries it on his back with Tomcat inside. They continue forward and notice man-sized mushrooms and faintly glowing crystals fill the mine on the outskirts of the dragon's territory. Stalactites hang from the ceiling. As they sneak ahead with a perception roll of a 22, they hear someone moving in metallic armor, perhaps a medium creature in plate armor. They also see an apparition a shimmering knight, overgrown with bright red fungus, hovering above a chasm, wielding a bright red sword that flows like ooze. It stands resolute, unperturbed by their presence, staring straight ahead. With an arcana roll of 21, Peacat knows this to be a guardian of faith of Zugtmoy, the demon queen of fungi. On high alert, the party creeps toward the guardian, but they only make it a few steps before a loud, piercing scream drills into their ears. Shriekers are guarding the entrance. Tomcat cringes at the sound. You're a bit flat, buddy. Roll initiative, round one. Tomcat Jones seeps out of the chest, casts haste on Peacat, then seeps back into the chest and says, put down the chest. Josie lays down a spike growth. Peacat steps up with a smirk on his face and a nonchalance that only a cat can exude. He prepares to use 600 feet of movement. You heard that correctly, 600. Here it is, 30 foot base movement, plus 10 from long strider, plus 10 from the mobile feet, multiplied by two with feline agility, that's 100 feet. That is again doubled because of haste to 200 and with a cunning action dash and a hasted action dash, that's 600 feet of movement without using his main action. Peacat climbs the 10-foot walls because he has a climbing speed as a tabaxi, runs 130 feet to circle around the long way to the plate-armored creature they heard while avoiding the Guardian of Faith and the spike growth. On the other side of the spike growth, Peacat drops down next to the 25-foot deep chasm and gets eyes on the war priest of Zukmoy wearing a helm with antlers made of twisted fungus, infested plate armor, and eyes dripping red ooze. Peacat closes the distance and uses his first attack to grapple, rolling a 30 on athletics, which is just enough to beat out the War Priest 7. He uses another 180 feet of movement to drag the War Priest around the edge of the chasm back to the spike growth. With the War Priest inside the spike growth and Peacat safely outside, he drags the priest 200 feet, dealing 80d4 damage, 8 0, for 193 damage. Peacat looks down at his now empty paws as the red fungal ooze drips down onto the trail of viscera that was once the war priest. With a second and final attack, Peacat hurls a dagger at the shrieker, striking it down and silencing it. Oh, I just hate it when they don't ask for an encore. From the ceiling, one of the stalactites unfurls its long tendrils, revealing a single blue eye. The roper attacks Josie, hits with a 19, but a reaction cast of shield causes it to bounce harmlessly away. The second attack targets Peacat and hits with a 22, grappling and restraining him. A third attack aimed at the chest hits with a 22, and a final attack misses Josie again. The Roper reels in his restrained prey directly in range of the Guardian of Faith. Fortunately for Tomcat, the crate provides total cover and protection from the Guardian. Peacat is forced to make a deck save with advantage from haste. A total of 17 is enough, so he only takes 10 radiant. With another attack, the Roper attempts to bite through the chest, but is unable to penetrate the thick wood. Tomcat readies a dash action. Josie casts command on the Roper, but it's unable to understand her language, so the spell auto fails. Peacat uses a bonus action to hulk out with Giant's Might growing to large size. He attacks the tendril with a rapier, barely hitting with the help of emboldening Bond. The sword pierces the tendril, destroying it. 
Peacat reaches up with his hand to grab onto the ceiling, drops the weapon into the chasm below, and easily grapples the roper. And so begins their journey into the mosh pit of death. That is the spike rope. Looks like you're going for a crowd surf. Moving past the guardian, Peacat fails his save and takes 20 radiant and proceeds to dish out 83 damage to the roper, shredded but still alive. Annoyed, Peacat drops the roper into the 25 foot chasm. Hoping the fall is enough to kill it, but it's only three damage and that's not quite enough. The Roper Tendril attacks Peacat four times, landing once. It pulls the feline closer, once again landing it in the Guardian's range. A successful save for half deals 10 Radiant, and the Roper attempts to bite Peacat with advantage, but misses with a 19. Tomcat Jones's turn. He peeks out of the chest to find himself at the bottom of the chasm, the chest having taken five fallen damage. It starts to splinter, but it's still intact. Without much in the way of damaging spells and the sad state of the roper, Tomcat simply passes his turn. Josie steps up and Eldritch blasts the monstrosity, missing on both attacks. To ensure the roper doesn't get another turn, Josie bardically inspires Peacat. Peacat's turn, and he smartly goes against his mobile nature and uses a bonus action for steady aim negating disadvantage from being restrained. He slashes out with his psychic blades, using them as devilish picks to strum his guitar and releasing a cacophonous wave of sound that deals enough damage to put the roper out of its misery. As they begin to explore the path to the south, Peacat uses second wind and several healing potions to restore 39 hit points and an antitoxin gaining resistance to poison for one hour. Needing to restore his feline agility by not moving for an entire turn, Peacat brushes out his whiskers, which curl up when he runs at top speed. The band gathers their things and stealths ahead around the corner of the tunnel. When they get within 60 feet, they spot a heap of rotting vegetation, the width of the entire pathway. Unbeknownst to the party, in response to the fighting in the other part of the mines, a drow mage has already summoned a shadow demon and cast minor illusion to conceal himself. Roll initiative. Josie moves forward to get within dark vision sight of the mound and fires off two Eldritch Blasts, hitting with both for 24 damage. The Shadow Demon fails its stealth roll as it dashes into the cavern through the wall, appearing behind the party. Tomcat Jones is forced to ooze out of his crate and viciously mocks the demon, dealing 4 damage, and it now has disadvantage on its next attack. Tomcat squeezes back into the chest. The Shambling Mound creeps forward 20 feet and dodges. Peacat lays into the Shadow Demon with a Psychic Blade action attack, a Tabaxi Claw attack, and a bonus action Psychic Blade attack for 10 total damage. From behind the mound, the party is unable to see, but can hear the chanting of a spell being cast. A 20-foot cube of web, carefully placed, catches all three party members and the shadow demon, which is immune to the restrained condition. That is important. Round two. Josie makes a save against web and rolls a nat one. Stuck. She eldritch blasts the shadow demon for 16 force damage. Josie then uses mantle of inspiration to provide the entire party with eight temp hit points and allow both of her bandmates to move as a reaction out of the web before they need to make a deck save against being restrained. Fantastic play. The Shadow Demon stealths toward the restrained Josie and takes a swipe, but misses despite advantage. It then moves into the wall, taking eight damage. Tomcat animates some gravel at the dark end of the tunnel, a spell that doesn't require sight of the object you're animating. The tiny rocks have blind sight and move around the tunnel, spotting the mage ducked behind the curved wall. The golden robe mage gasps at the unexpected sight of the animated objects. They dart in for the attack. The mage casts shield, but five attacks still get through for 31 damage. The drow makes all five con saves though to maintain concentration on the web spell. The shambling mound creeps 20 feet again and dodges, which has no effect on the peacat's next move, which is to dart forward and grapple the large pile of rotting vegetation. The initial roll of 18 is outmatched by the mound's 22, but Follow-up Sinak and Talisman rolls bring Peacat's total to 24, enough to get his paws around the plant. Peacat barrels the mound backward into the side passage, and due to the mobile feat, he's able to push past the mound without an opportunity attack. This gives him eyes on the Drow Mage. An attack with the use of Bardic Inspiration isn't enough, though, to penetrate the Drow's shield, which is still active. In game, there was a brief discussion about whether or not the animated objects get opportunity attacks if the Drow Mage was to move. The answer is no, and here's Chris's response why. They only act as I direct them on my turn. Uh, they don't act independently of me, so although it would provoke opportunity attacks, they don't take them because they're not commanded to do it. The Drow Mage slinks back into the corridor and unleashes Everett's black tentacles on the animated objects, 
which causes the web spell to fade. Josie's turn, and she's no longer restrained as the webs melt away around her. She readies an Eldritch Blast for the Shadow Demon. And the Shadow Demon materializes, and Josie's Eldritch Blast hit for 21 damage. The Demon attacks with disadvantage from Vicious Mockery and misses Josie. Round 3. Tomcat Jones steps up, insulting the Demon with another Vicious Mockery for 4 damage. The animated objects are forced to save against the tentacles, and 5 succeed. The remaining take 15 damage and are restrained. The five that succeeded race toward the Drow Mage and attack. The Mage throws up another shield in response, stopping two of the three hits. The damage has the Drow on Death's Door, but he's still alive and succeeds in the con save for Everett's Black Tentacles. Peacat's turn, and he fails the deck save to escape the tentacles and takes 13 damage. Fortunately, the Mound approached on its turn. Peacat stabs at the Mound with Psychic Blades, dealing eight psychic damage. He follows that up with a slash from his claws, harmlessly bouncing off the decaying plant. The final bonus action blades land for seven more psychic. The lack of movement has recharged his feline agility. The mage contemplates the situation, then Misty steps away and takes off down the blackened corridor. The loud screeches from the shriekers. <laughs> the only sign of his escape. Josie steps past the shadow demon, which misses its opportunity attack and is killed by an Eldritch Blast for its trouble. The second blast deals 11 damage to the mound. Tomcat commands his gravel to chase after the mage as three of the five stuck in the tentacles die. The other objects chase after the mage as Tomcat dashes toward the mound. The shambling mound swipes at Peacat, landing both blows, and drags him into its body, engulfing the feline and dealing a total of 28 damage. Now engulfed, there is a question on whether the target is pulled into the mound's space or is simply restrained where it was hit. Ludic rules the latter, which most of the table agreed with, Put your thoughts in the comments below. This means that at the start of Peacat's turn, he takes another 16 damage from the tentacles. There's a bit of confusion here as Peacat uses Uncanny Dodge on this damage, which was not an attack and should instead have been used on the mounds attacks. So 8 damage was prevented this way. Peacat then takes both attacks and Sinac to finally shove the mound away, ending the restrained condition from the mound, and then bonus action activates the Hill Rune to gain resistance on bludgeoning, piercing, slashing damage for 1 minute. The Drow Mage, angry at the pursuing objects, blasts off a lightning bolt for 32 damage, but three of the five objects make their save and survive the shock. Josie blasts the mound for 12 damage. Tomcat sends the remaining objects after the retreating mage, and they barely make it into melee, doing enough damage to finally slay the magic user and remove the black tentacles, ending the need for dispel magic, which was the plan for the turn. Tomcat turns his attention to the mound, mocking it again with slimy mock tentacles and branches of ooze, and it fails to save. The Shambling Mound makes two attacks, one with disadvantage, and hits for nine damage, cut in half to four. Peacat's turn, and he grapples the mound and pushes it next to his allies. As they look at each other like, what the F is he doing? He stabs the mound in the back, if it had a back. A whole lot of ones on these rolls, but the second attack hits, dealing 15 damage on a crit. Not great but he pulls the mound away from his allies and runs away from the mound, which is unable to take an opportunity attack. What follows are a series of attacks from Josie and Peacat as Tomcat disengages and retreats as they pick away at the mound until round seven when Peacat hurls a psychic blade deep inside the plant, killing it. He sneers. There's only one plant in rock and roll and he comes from the land of the ice and snow. The party searches the fallen drow and finds the first key with a spidery symbol of Loth on it. And now they must decide what to do next. And that's where we'll end it today. Thanks everyone for watching and a big thank you to Only Crits for sponsoring the video. If you like the gauntlets and you want to try them out, you can join the Discord to play there or use the gauntlets in your own games. And of course, if you want to support the channel, please check out my Patreon for cool perks and voting options. See you here next time, folks.